Question one, was there ever a time when drums felt like work or was it always just fun to play and work stuff out? I mean, I feel like in a way right now, it kind of feels like work. Not in, in the sense where I'm not enjoying it, but just when you're doing it professionally and you're struggling financially because of that, it kind of hijacks the, the headspace of that a little bit where you just start thinking like, okay, how can I make my next dollar through this gig or through this thing? And if you're making your money through art, they just kind of you're thinking artistically, but in terms of like, I need to live, I need to make money. How do I do that? So it's not like it takes the fun out of the art, but I feel like it adds a, a layer to it. You know what I mean? It's a slippery slope. No, what, what did I want to say? Not slippery slope. It's a razor edge. Cause I just quit. I just quit a day job. And so like, I'm in this sort of post, post working for the man pre going broke honeymoon, which is like the best feeling. And then maybe I'll go broke and then that'll suck. But it's funny because how broke do I have to be before I'll be happy to have a job again. And from where I sit now, the answer is pretty broke. But the I, other problem we're with opposites it, right now, dude, I'm like been freelancing for since I moved here two years ago. And now I'm just at that point where I'm like, I need, I need a part-time job or something. Cause it's just not, that's the thing with freelancing. That's like, it's the beauty and the curse of it. Cause it's like, when you're good, you're good and there's work. But then literally two months later, you can go to nothing. And then you're just sitting there like, I have two gigs coming up in the next week and I have $30 in my bank account. <laughs> and you're like, okay, shit, I need to figure this out. So that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, I, I went through that in like 2015 and 2016. The first time I quit my job, I had this really punishing job uh, at a university that I won't name, but I'd been there for a decade and it was just like a bunch of politics. And, and finally I was just like, I, I can't do this anymore. I don't care if I go broke. And then right away I just went broke. <laughs> and it took about two years before I was, I was happy to have a day job again. I, I was doing some like consulting to like help creators. And then one of my clients was like, would you like to come on full time? And I was like, yes, I would. <laughs> So maybe my, yeah, maybe my time span is two years. Maybe that's how, that's, maybe that's how long I need to be broke before I'm just like, give me a job. Well, it depends on the level of broke too. There's like, there's like, I'm kind of struggling. I don't have much, but I'm getting by. And then there's like, I do not have money and I need it. Right. And that's when you like, if you're at that point, you just got to bite the bullet and like do something else or like really, I don't know, figure something out quick, but you can only live in that like stress state for so, so long until you're like, fuck it, dude, I'm going to just bite the bullet, which is what I've been like. It's not like a pride thing. I know, like, I think there's an element of a pride thing where I know I'm not like above working some whatever job. But it's like when you enter the freelance, like just full time musician, and it is working for a while, even if you're just like kind of slipping by a little bit, you do have that feeling of like, oh, I'm doing it. Like, this is cool. I can keep that going. And you kind of start lying to yourself. And then you have a couple months where you're like, barely able to do it. And you're like, no, this is fine. And then eventually it's like, dude, just get a fucking job. Because my goal is like, get a job, get ahead, and then quit the job again. You know, it's not you a that time, it's a temporary thing. Yeah. <laughs> Hire Joel. He'll crush it for like two months. <laughs> yeah. Just get a savings, get ahead. I mean, that's how it is. It's like, and there's no reason that should be looked at as a bad thing. It's like most professional musicians at some point were doing the part-time job, part-time music thing until they could fully... Like everyone's struggling, man. It's hard. Like there's no, no shame in it. And un the unfortunate thing is that the, the things that lead to quote unquote breaking out of that cycle are 
nonlinear, meaning it's not just hours you put in. It's like you can spend five years building a YouTube channel and just being broke. And then suddenly it's big enough that you can just send an email and make enough money to, su to support yourself, which knock on wood, I'm privileged to be in that position. And to the degree I can help any other creators crack the nut, which is really limited, but. Well, it's kind of like a, it's like the social media effect of like a, it's like you can kind of equate it to like a, a gambling addiction. Cause it's like, you can, you can view it as though like every time you upload, you're kind of like pulling the slot machine of the algorithm and being like, I fucking hope this is the one. Cause I mean, it can be, it probably won't be, but everyone's kind of hoping for that like viral moment. And I feel like everyone's kind of has that, not everyone, but sometimes you have that in the ether and you're like uploading a video that you like think is cool. You're like, I don't know, maybe this will do well. And it's just like this like slot machine type of, it's some component to the social media addiction, I think. It is, yeah. And, and the other trouble about it is that what's, what's most useful to like build a scaffold to a career isn't always what gives you the most dopamine. Oh, so absolutely. Yeah. A lot of times with Instagram, I'm just like, I made this video. I think it's sick. Like, let me hit upload or like, here's something I think is super funny. And I, I wouldn't want to lose that aspect of it. And I, I think, I think honestly, maybe you're being a little bit too, you're, you're underrating uh, the, the utility of, being on Instagram a little bit just because like it, it can feel like it's just one off, one off, one off, like maybe something will hit virally and maybe it won't. But what may, what people don't see is like behind the scenes, all these people in the industry starting to take notice and then just one day some, something clicks and, and then it's kind of like the ability to, to parlay that. But the other thing I think is like there's, there's still this huge asymmetry between talent and reach. So like the, the social media algorithms or whatever it is are still not really good at sorting the, the best people. Like it, it, it makes you feel like there's, there's nobody, there are no scouts anymore. Right. Mm. Or, or if, if there are perversely, they're looking for people who already have a following. So, so that's why I say to everybody, it's just yeah. like whatever else you're doing, like blah, blah, who, like, what do I know? Right. But it's just, you know, it's w what worked for me. Um, whatever else you're doing, like save some time to, to upload. Uh, personally, I'm going to get on TikTok next week. Yeah. That's, my, my wife told me TikTok was like growing quicker than, than Instagram. <sighs> and I know YouTube's a little bit, YouTube feels a little bit stalled. It's just like super hard to get traction on YouTube anymore. So like, fuck it. I'm going to get on TikTok. I'll like, I'll make some drum videos in a chicken costume or something. I don't give a shit. I should. I've like, I may, I have a TikTok. I made one. I've uploaded a couple times, but I just like deleted it off my phone. I'm just like, everyone I feel like has that wall of like a certain social media app where they're like, they turn into an old man and they're like, I don't want to fucking get on this. But I know it's probably good or useful because that is the thing. It's like as much as I sometimes can shit on social media, it's objectively useful. Like almost every opportunity I've ever had. I mean, that's how I, I ever met you or anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's a weird dichotomy of like this is an addiction that can like really take a toll on people's lives, but it also can progress them in their life. It's yeah. strange. I hate I hate the the fighting of that reality. I don't really know how to yeah. navigate it sometimes. I guess so. And it's I kind of view it like alcohol. Like I don't completely buy that it's a hundred percent bad for everybody. I think for certain people it's bad. And having it rule your life instead of having it in balance is is bad. But yeah. anyway. I, I, I think it's I think it's good to to let it play a part in your life and to enjoy it and and exactly as you say it's like we wouldn't have discovered each other 
without Instagram. I do want to talk more about drums and your abilities, though. So you do a fair amount of teaching. And of course, I'm obsessed with what great drummers did to become great. So let me phrase this this way. What do you think the biggest misconception you hear from young drummers is about what it takes to get to greatness or however you define that? Hmm. Or what's something you know about what it took to get to your level that the average student you talk to doesn't? Dude, I feel like it's like when most people, a lot of lessons I give and a lot of times when I hear like intermediate drummers that are on the come up, it's like, I feel like they think it's a kind of one, one size fits all approach. And I think they get caught a little bit too much in the rigidity of like practicing certain stuff, like taking flow, for example, I feel like a lot of people are like, I, I practice my rudiments and I know my patterns and I can't get to that level of like flow, like Forrest or Andy or Chris or whatever. And it's like, well, that's because the at like what makes flow flow isn't some rigid you do x and then you flow you know what i mean i run into that a lot so i feel like a lot of my lessons are centered around reframing because i honestly think of, i've seen just like audible sentences like just shift someone's perspective with the drums and i feel like make them get better it's just a lot of it's just a reframing thing so it's like no one that's really flowing, like when Ronald Bruner's just ripping, he's not thinking like paradiddle diddle, paradiddle, right, left, left, you know what I mean? So it's like, I feel like bringing language to drums and uh, using a lot of analogies and reframing to get people to realize that like, although there are the moments where you have to be rigid and like shed certain stuff, there's a lot more creative approaches and improvisational approaches to kind of get to another level. I always tell people like, if you're working on a new concept, find your like, get, move that concept into improv as quickly as you can. Cause like you, I view improv as like, that's the location you want your ideas to arrive within. Why do you think there's so little emphasis on practicing improv and, and frameworks for practicing improv in sort of traditional drum instruction? Because I think it's hard to teach and there's an element to it that isn't like you can't, there is an element of just kind of mystery and you can't grasp it and you can't make it tangible. And I feel like when a lot of people, if they're not really good teachers or something, they're just kind of looking for the, like, I need to provide an answer here and I need to sell my course or whatever. And so I'm just going to be rigid with it. it. But that's like the beauty of in the, the wonder of improv and in communication and all that is like, you can only conceptualize it so much until you, there is a moment of like, like every time, like I always students that are like kind of struggling to like grasp that I'm like, think about every time you talk, you're improvising. And there's like a level of mystery to that. Like the fact that every time we, we speak and we say a sentence, we start it not knowing what we're going to say. And then we arrive at the end of the sentence logically like that's, that is a level of like, how do, how the fuck do we do that? Like, I can't articulate how every human does that. There is a level of like kind of flow and mystery to it. And I feel like to really truly teach that stuff, you have to honor that quality of it. And what, what taxonomy do you draw, if any, between states of mind when you're practicing where you're somewhat self-critical, like you're trying to lock up with a click or make this lick cleaner and those where you want to throw out the self-critical voice entirely and just let yourself speak musically. So there's, I feel like there's a, a merging of the two that I like to go for. And I, that's what I think kind of tying back to what you asked before is crucial when you're working on new stuff, it's like, I call it just like conceptual improv or kind of like boundary improv where it's like, like, let's say when I was really diving into quintuplets and septuplets, it was like, most of that was improv. Like I would just spend 
literally like 80% of the time I was playing drums, I was within one of those two subdivisions. But I might go in there with like a mildly rigid idea of like, okay, I'm going to shed in like quintuplets today. But like, I want to work on like more right hand freedom over it. So I might come up with a couple like different ostinatos in that or just different accent points within the fives. And then I'll just sit there and try to get free under it. So I'm still trying to improvise within it, but I have like something in mind that's like reaching me further to this goal, but it's still improv based. And then if I come across some shit and I, I, I'm like, oh, this isn't working and I need to just sit there and work this specific thing, then I will. It's kind of like Matt Gartska said about like, you're kind of discovering a thing to practice within improv. But I think going in with a little boundary like that will help. It'll help you break from the, the rigid aspect of it and kind of help you get your voice. And again, it's like, that's when that start, that stuff will start coming out and you're playing. Cause if you never practice something in the setting of improv, then you're practicing it rigid. And then when you're on the stage and maybe some elements are different than they are in your, your practice room, you're going to have a hard, a harder time for that to like find its way naturally into your playing. If you've never worked on that thing in like a free setting, you know what I mean? It would be like te teaching language by asking people to memorize full sentences. Yeah, exactly. And then wondering why they can never just converse freely. So it's like, well, what if what if the person you're talking to zigs instead of zags? Like, exactly. You're fucked. You're just like deer in headlights. Yeah. Yeah. And that's I think a lot of people are missing that element of it. So it's just like part of I feel like being a good educator is just reframing things and making it land through analogy to where it's like oh okay it is like it is just like speaking it's the same thing i'm also interested i'm also fascinated by the types of students that approach various different teachers because practically everybody who approaches me has done a bunch of technical homework and they're very they're usually on the self-conscious side of the spectrum and they usually need to increase their confidence with their voice improvising and learn to sort of jump off the cliff and not fear failure as much i feel like there's a completely other species of student who i see in other people's comments occasionally and sometimes they lead over to mine who are already hot dogs they think they're they think they're the greatest and their, their stuff is sloppy or it's it's out of time and actually they need to come back to earth and focus on detail more but those people never approach me for lessons where do you feel like your students fall on that spectrum i feel like they're not i don't find like a lot of that's interesting because you would think like if someone kind of thinks they're hot shit they're that that to me would seem like the person that wouldn't reach out for a lesson because to reach out for a lesson, at least how I would look at it is like, there's already a level of humility in that where you're going, I'm not beneath this person, but like I view them on some level to where I'm reaching out to learn from them so that there's already a, like an ego dissipation within that. So I, I have never run into that. I feel like I've run into more what you're saying, mm -hmm. more where people, it's either like they want to get better at flow or they want to get better at like the odd shit. That's usually what I'm hit up for. Mm -hmm. But I usually find like a good level of humility within my students. I, I also haven't had firsthand experience with someone, well, as I was saying, who's who's hit me up for a lesson and then been super arrogant. Maybe when I used to teach in storefront music schools. That's where I think. And a lot of that it. was like high school kids who didn't want to be there. And that's very, very different than someone who's spending their own money because yeah, exactly. they decided to dedicate themselves. That seems like that would be just very strange if like someone's paying you with their own money and their own time and they're going to like think they're the shit. I mean, I have had it like we've all had and it, you almost feel bad sometimes if it happens, but it's, it's actually good is the moment where like, a student's not being arrogant, but the moment where you see the student has that epiphany of like, oh, fuck, like, I'm not where I thought I was. And sometimes you have to kind of do that as a teacher, not in like a, not in a, a douchey way, but like, you know, I've had people hit me up for like, I want to dive into quintuplets and I'm like, cool, like what, 
what's some like general five vocab you have? And they're like, I've never really done anything in five. And I'm like, well, let's not start with quintuplets. You know what I mean? Like let's, let's just build like a five base first. So you, there is some times where you'll have the student that's like eager for something that I think is a little above their pay grade at that moment. And you kind of have to bring them back down. And that can be humbling for people, I think. Yeah, completely. There are a couple of different directions to go here. I, d- I definitely want to ask you about hard knocks because that's something I've been talking to everybody about. But before that, I want to get more deeply into the quintuplet thing because after you came to visit New York last year, I was I spent... I think I'm still kind of doing it like the the practice routine that I use now is still kind of an offshoot of that where you were switching from 30 seconds to septuplets. So from like yeah. eight, eight notes to seven notes with the quarter note sort of constant in your head. And my way of getting into that was instead to, to visualize a bar of four, four and a bar of seven, eight. So that instead of thinking at the, at the septuplet level, I was thinking slightly more big beat, Mm -hmm. but this leads me to ask, like, say somebody wants to practice these five or seven subdivisions and they've never done it before. What's your first suggestion for like the easiest way to get into it? I, whatever. So I, there's a lot of ways, but usually I, I try to get instill in them that like, whatever will get you to internalize it the rate itself, the quickest go for that. Like, so like when I started getting into quintuplets, I already had a good five vocab. Like I was already comfortable in five, four, five, eight, five, sixteen, And then I realized like, Oh, a quintuplet is you're just fitting that into the space of a quarter note. So that's why I do think it's important to like establish, like learn how to play in five, eight, like learn some like basic five vocab first. Because if you don't have that, like quintuplets are like, you're speaking in five, like five, eight, you can argue you're still thinking kind of evenly, but like, there's no way around it. If you're in quintuplets, you can't like cheat that, like you're, you're in fives. So it's like, you need a decent five vocab. Um, And then, yeah, I just, I just teach some ideas that will get you to like internalize the rate as quick as you can, like anything else, like triplets, like 16th notes. Um, because you can't ever really fully be comfortable in it if you have to kind of rely on like certain crutches with it. Like I have to play this certain pattern and land it here. And it's like, then you're not really internalizing the rate. You're more so like memorizing certain patterns that align with it. You know what I mean? So you kind of have to like ensure you're really feeling that, uh, the rate of the quintuplet or else I feel like it's kind of going to, not fully work interesting okay well cool that that means i'm not completely off base with my approach like i think one thing that's helped me is hearing like higher subdivisions in relation to the big beat so there's this thing ages ago i did did this video with chris peprota where we were talking about like can you can you snap five half notes and then sing in groups of five quarter notes over that and then five eighth notes and then five sixteen and then triplets groups of five over triplets and see how those those cycle and I feel like when I do start going directly for quintuplets in say four it's it's a different entry point but I feel like my brain will already have that territory so that my ears will be like, Oh, this is, this is familiar. I recognize this. I recognize these Hills. Yeah. Yeah. And thinking rhythmically, you know, like with set up, I tend to think of it in the four and the, uh, ticket, 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 like the, those two point or the three ticket, 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 ticket. But I usually try to think of it in some, like I, I can just think of it straight, but it is a bit easier if you have some like rhythmic anchor, in your head, even if you're not accentuating it, like even if I'm totally phrasing weird within it, like that's kind of still going on in my head just to keep me grounded in it easier. And same with like quintuplets, like the two, three or the three, two way. Um, 
Because you need something to kind of hold on to, especially in your first when people are first getting into it, just to make it easier on the brain, and just to make it so you don't have to count. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. If I'm thinking tick a tick a tick a tick a tick a like I don't have to count one two three four five one two three four five one. You know. So I I think too people overcomplicate odd shit a lot when it mm-hmm. doesn't need to be that complex. Right. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's less so now just because there's so much like VJI or uh, Tigran, all the prog rock, 30 years of fusion. So it's a little bit, there's a little bit less of a mystique. Yeah. Yeah. But still, I think people like, I don't know. They kind of think it's this beast that's like too hard to tackle. And I think there are ways with just chunking or cutting how you count. Like, there's modified ways of going about it that make it much easier to grasp. Mm-hmm. When when you realize 1916 is just 4-4 four, four with 316 after it, mm-hmm. that makes it a lot more easy to grasp than just someone saying, play a 19 and you just count to 19. Like, that's like an unbelievably not helpful way of like going about, you know what I mean? Yeah. You have to find, especially the higher numbers, you have to find something to like grasp it easier or it's just not going to work. Yeah. I like this concept of chunks too, because it's like the brain can only think of so many discrete things at once. Exactly. Like there's, there's a speed limit to that, but if you can make one discrete unit contain nested within it, other things, that's sort of the hack. That's, that's how people play Paganini or do parkour. In, yeah. As far as I can tell. Well, it also opens up phrasing too, because it starts getting you different rhythmic ideas. Like like the three, four way of septuplets, I think is so much more challenging than the four, three way. And then, so that will start like just making your, your playing within that group more unique as well and make you start hearing different hits to go for and, so thinking even in the chunking thing serves like a cool rhythmic purpose to get you outside of the box. Like I remember with the quintuplets, I was always on the two, three way. That's usually how people start the ticket, ticket, the ticket, ticket, the tick. But then I was like, I don't do the three, two way a lot. The ticket, ticket, check, tick, 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 And now that's my favorite way. Like that's how you can get the Dilla sound. You can get way more interesting phrasing. And it's just by chunking it differently. So I think there's a, a really good musical application to chunking as well in terms of like getting comfortable in the odd stuff. Totally. So speaking of people thinking stuff is instant surmountable, but it's not. Do, do you feel like actually playing chops is kind of like the four minute mile in that regard where people will still see choppers on Instagram or YouTube and think that's magic, but if if they just put in the work and or had a teacher that could break it down for them, maybe they're not going to sound like Ron Bruner, but they'll definitely make a lot of headway if they want to. Yeah. I mean, I think obviously it's like somehow the conversation still being had in the drum world of like groove, the whole groove chop fucking rivalry. But I feel like more people now are kind of like, going away from that and being like, yeah, chops are cool. They serve their purpose. Um, we don't need to like shame them in any way and we don't need to shame pocket. But I think, I think anyone can get to the point where they're flowing better and have deeper chops. Again, a lot of like what I'm seeing with that, like when you talk to the crazier cats, like Andy and Garska and Forrest and all them, it's like, they just have really unique approaches in framing of say Matt Bover. Like they have just interesting approaches when it comes to chops. And that's the difference I see is like the, the people I see with like more boxy kind of stale chops kind of have that very rigid approach. And then you talk to certain dudes like Mason or something and you're like, Oh, you're thinking of this. Like your framing of this is so much different. And I think that's, what's leading them down to like, cause at the end of the day, it's like, we're playing singles, doubles in some variation of a kick. Like that's almost what every single chop is. So there has to be something deeper there that makes someone who has like crazy chops versus not. I think it's just all like a framing thing. 
there's an interesting concept there too of like orthodoxy versus innovate with something and my own personal story with it was like what 2012 2013 i suddenly became aware of this this phrase i'm not allowed to say because i got a cease and desist but we'll just call it say berkeley chops like as opposed to i don't know jazz or ringo or anything else it's it's this different style and i wanted to feel like i was focused so i think i spent a lot of time trying to trying to get that style like the, like a language like the essence of what made that style like it was jazz and now i feel like i know enough of the basics that even if it's slower i can kind of play a a break like a church drummer would like yeah it might not be as clean it might it might not be as quick but i don't i don't see very many of that videos of that playing and think i don't understand what's going on it's it's usually either i can play this or i can play a version of this that's slower and and so what that's allowed me to do is to free up a lot of bandwidth to to just innovate like if i'm in the practice room and i spend three weeks just working on something that's not chops i no longer have this feeling like oh god i'm not practicing chops every day yeah 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 it's kind of, I feel that. I mean, it, it, and I feel like a lot of chops too is like just developing, you're like trying to deepen your muscle memory. I mean, I guess all drumming, right? But like, you're, yeah, you're just trying to figure out, you have your pocket of like, I know how to do this. And you're just trying to expand like what your body's comfortable doing. Because I feel like, again, when you're really in that flow state, when it comes to um, chops, I, I view chop. It's like I'm guiding the chop. I'm not like thinking of what it is, and that's another reframing where I feel like that's a huge thing. It's like, it's like a sentence. It's like I I know what I'm wanting to say. I'm guiding, but I'm not thinking of every word prior to it happening. Because if you did, you couldn't. You cannot flow. It's not. I don't even think it's like a. It it makes it hard to flow. It's like you just can't. I just, I think that there's like, there's, you, it just wouldn't be functional. Yeah. So in the more, you it know, like, like you were saying, it's like, you know, enough now or it's like, okay, I'm having an idea. Like I hear some drummer do something. It's like, okay, I kind of get the gist of that rhythmically. I can fill out the space. I can go for it. I can guide it there. And then it's just physically being able to do it on a level that's tight. Totally. But yeah, you get to a point where you're like, there's rarely a chop I see now where I'm like, what the fuck is that? I might not be able to play it, but the 95% of chops, I'm like, I get what they're doing generally. And every yeah. now and then I'll watch some Andy video where I'm like, I, what the fuck is this dude doing? Like, I just, some crazy sweep thing where I'm like, I don't even understand. Yeah, I, I would say Andy and Mike Mitchell and a couple others still appear magic to me on a regular basis. But uh, I, I don't want to... I don't want to sound disrespectful because just because I can figure out what somebody's doing does not diminish the talent or the musicality. So for instance, Brian Blade, right? It's like, that's part of the beauty of his playing is like, there's nothing super mysterious about it. It's just like the feeling and the vibe. So no disrespect to anyone when I say this, but s sort of, sort of same, i.e. like besides a couple players, like most people I'll see, now I'm sort of like, yeah, I kind of, I kind of get what they're doing. Yeah. And that's not, a, I don't think it's a disrespect thing at all. It's like, it's just a, you can understand it. It's like you said, there's stu tons of stuff. Like I'm thinking of skateboarding right now. It's like, okay, I can hard flip, but there's a lot of skaters that will do a hard flip. I'm like, I can't hard flip like that though. Or I can't do it down a 15 stair. You know what I mean? So it's like, you can understand how the mechanics of something works and still, maybe not be able to do it or not be able to do it in their way. And yeah, I don't, I don't think that's disrespectful. I think that's just what comes with growing your knowledge and your skill on the kit. There's kind of no way around it. Yeah. Interesting point about the skating. And that brings up a question, which is, do you feel like simultaneously being a skater and a drummer has helped give you a better way to conceptualize 
flow? I don't know. Because I feel like there are some parallels to um, drumming and skating. And I think that's always kind of why I liked it too and why I never liked team sports. It was mostly the freedom aspect of it. But when it comes to flow, I'm not sure. I'm trying to think because I feel like skating doesn't I, – I don't know if I would really consider it to be like a kind of flow state type of activity. But just because maybe it's more high stakes – It's like, I'm not going to fucking break my back drumming. So like skating, it's like kind of, well, I guess it it might be less flow state, but it's much, it's similar in the way of like, like, especially when I was skating something like scary, like if I was doing jumping down stairs and stuff, like your focus, it's like kind of when you're live and you're on some shit that's like, oh, this is like a hard song. I need to be like locked in. That element, I think, is similar. Again, the stakes are much higher when you're doing skating because you can kill yourself doing it. But it is that zone of like there, there is something here that's scary, whether it's physical or whatever with the drums. It's like it does lock you in more. How long have you skated? Uh, I was like skating probably since I was like eight but then when i was like in seventh grade i was like okay i just want to skate and then i basically did that all through till senior year of high school like i was skating way more than i was drumming i wasn't taking drumming seriously Mm -hmm. and then now i'll still skate every now and then but obviously i'm a bit more hesitant too because i don't want to fuck myself up but like all through high school that's every day it's all i did yeah with uh jujitsu i i feel like i'm constantly seeing examples that relate to drumming. And I wonder if that's because I'm newer to it. Cause How if you were skating you from it? an early age, I started in my late thirties and I'm 44 now. Okay. So, oh, you're 44. What the fuck? I thought you were yeah. younger. Everyone now. says to do jujitsu, man. I haven't tried it, but I've heard, I've heard good stuff. It's, it's a real time commitment. That's that. That's a whole other conversation. But my point is like some of the chunking and like the muscle memory and the the feeling of improvisation and and those sort of things feel similar. I guess that too is skating too. Like there's certain tricks that lead to other tricks. Did you ever skate? No. I mean, I've been on a skateboard and tried it, but never seriously. But there's like, I mean, not to dive into like technicalities of it but they're like if you learn a kick flip there's like the next logical step like you learn a fakie flip or a varial flip and i feel like there's certain chops sometimes have that same thing where it's like okay like this pattern i just got down pretty comfortable like let me add on this little chunk to it like this is the next logical step from there you know what i mean i feel like you can kind of start seeing um uh, chops that way and, and a lot of polyrhythms and like independence that way as well. Like, yeah. If you start getting the three and like a dotted eighth in the right hand over some stuff, it's like, we'll add that one note that, 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 and then go to the, f- go for like a five rhythm in it. Like that's always how I kind of approached, uh, polyrhythms and shit. Yeah. So like once you're in it, it leads you, which makes sense. Cause you don't want to overwhelm the system too much you know you kind of got to start it's like a cake you're just layering on shit Mm -hmm. so i feel like that yeah it probably applies more to independent stuff than chops really but that stuff i wish like do you get hit up a lot about that like i just got hit up about that uh the other day but i feel like i don't get hit up about independent stuff enough and i almost i wish i'd got more like students with that like do you do you teach that stuff a lot i I do, but as an adjunct, I think most people who hit me up are either interested in jazz or flow. And I sort of see independence as an idea generator and a a way to just strengthen your conversational ability, just like improving your pronunciation or something. Because if you're, if you have independence, then you're burning less bandwidth by definition with things happening at the same time. So you have more to spare for ideas. Maybe that's a cool way to look at it. I never thought about it that way. That's true though. I feel like it's so important though. And I feel like it's such an overlooked 
the most overlooked thing I find in drumming. Like, cause I've seen dudes that can, I mean, just murder in a shed, but then you give them like, dit, 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 and you're like, play anything under it and it just falls apart. So it's like conversation doesn't only happen in the chop world. It's like conversation can happen a lot or like the ability to, to say something and speak. I feel it can happen on a way deeper level in the, in the groove world. I don't know, man. I feel like there's such a deeper, deeper level, deeper world with the independence that I feel like not enough people, I don't know, maybe if people just aren't interested in it or maybe they just don't, it slips their mind. I don't know. But it does seem like chops and flow is like, that's the thing everyone's searching for. I guess. Yeah. It's, it's funny because I almost have the opposite experience where I guess not people approaching me for lessons so much, but like when I ask people, what should I make videos about? Or people just approaching me with random questions. A lot of it's about independence. And my feeling about that has always been like, okay, so that you can do what? Like, what is this independence helping? But maybe I need to be more open-minded to it as just an idea generator in and of itself. I mean, if you're playing jazz, it's obvious that you need independence. If you're playing Afro-Cuban music, it's obvious that you need independence. Yeah. If you're playing like Ringo Star Beats, do you really need independence for that? I don't know. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I think <clears throat> that touched a good point that I, I think about a lot is the whole like, and I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts on this realm of like, why do I need quintuplets? When am I ever going to play it? Why do I need independence? And I think sometimes people look too much at the specific and don't extract out. So you could, it would be like going to the gym and being like, why do I need to do like a lap pull down? When am I ever going to grab something and pull it down? It's like, well, you're, it's not, it's so you're building strength and you know what I mean? It's like we, we see working out and we extract out to see like, I'm doing this motion to build X muscle or whatever, but it's like, yeah, I'm never going to be doing this probably like functionally. So sometimes it's like, I don't know. There's like certain like, um, poly stuff or like independent stuff I've shed where I'm like, yeah, I will. I'll probably never need to do this fucking exact thing on a gig, but the skill I gain from that, has translated immensely into the stuff I am playing on the gig. So I think sometimes that can be a good way for people to be less in that, like, why do I need this shit? I'm never going to use it. <clears throat> it's like, no, you're never going to use the specific motion, but you will use that, the idea that that motion exists within. Yeah. I, I also think about it in terms of just time being limited. Like we don't have 12 hours a day to practice. So... For me personally, I feel like there are two kind of big idea generators. Number one is something I want to be able to do. So, so I guess the gym analogy would be like, I want to have sick traps or something. Like I, I, I need a more muscular neck. I need a bigger chest. So then you work backward from that. So it's like, all right, what are the, what are the best exercises? But the other is just pure whim. Like this, I saw this thing and it seems really interesting to me. Or I, I sat down and just started exploring and this thing came out and I just like the way it sounds and feels. Um, but, but as I said, I think the, the, for me, there's a perfectly good justification for a lot of independence for my students just within the, the broader goal of I want to flow better. So I, I guess I'm agreeing with you, albeit from sort of a different path. Yeah. It's like, I, that's always what I say too. It's like with quintuplets, especially with the quintuplets, septuplets shit or any independent, it's like anything you learn, it's like, you're just adding more things you can say and more things you can say freely. That's really it. Like it's sometimes it's not, it's so easy to like conceptualize and get super deep with everything. But sometimes it's nice to just sit back and be like, it's pretty simple. It's like, I, I, I fuck with quintuplets because it allows me to say more things. That's it. Like, it's, yeah. it can just be that. I guess the failure mode is somebody spending a lot of time on something that's not 
immediately useful to them and not because they have a passion for it, but just because they feel like they're supposed to do it. And I will say throwing in everything I just said, that being said, I also will, I have been at times where like, I'll ask people at the beginning of the lesson, like, what are your goals? Like, are you, if you want to just play some music with your buddies, play a couple gigs, do some bar things. I'm like, don't shed quintuplets. Like if that's what your goal is, there's nothing wrong with that. And I'll help you get to your goal. But I do agree with what you're saying too. There is a time where it is like, well, what are your goals? And if, if shedding left foot claves in seven is, has nothing to do with your fucking goal. Well then, yeah, there is also a time and place to be like, I don't need to work on this thing. And that's, especially as you get older, like you said, and your time is limited. I mean, that's a useful thing too. Like I've had that realization with left foot clave stuff. I'm like, I'm just never going to be good at it. And I've just accepted that. And that's fine. I'm just never going to put the time into it. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, this would require seven years and yes. I'm just not willing to do that right now. Exactly. And there might be useful skill that would find its way into my playing. Like I was saying before, but the amount of time I'd have to put into it to be like decent at it is just like, Oh, I could just put to get better at the things I'm trying to get better. You know what I mean? So all that being said, yeah, there is also like you said, a line where some people think they need to work on it. And it's like, maybe not now, maybe down the line, but it's all goal oriented. You know, like what's your goal as a drummer? But I do yeah. think there are people that have the like, I just want to be free and be the best drummer I can be and all that. And then they still have that like, oh, but why do I need sevens? And you're like, okay, well, I don't know. It can sometimes just feel weird. Like there's like a weird stigma around it sometimes. When I just feel like it's like, it's just a, another way to say anything. My camera stopped at exactly the moment I was asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> totally spontaneously we're not re-recording this at all what would you say your goals are at this moment like straight musically we're not talking about kind of like life tangibly i i guess musically as it relates to career goals because obviously right now i'm like just trying to figure out how to make it out here financially but i don't know it's kind of like i'm i'm trying kind of shifting a bit more too into really wanting to get into more production and songwriting and selling selling beats and working with singers. And so, so I feel like a lot of my musical goals are also shifting into like more on the piano side and production side. Um, Cause I've been finding some more interest in that. And then as a drummer, I'm, I, I feel like I still always kind of care about like, I want to, I want to be good. Duh. But like, I'm kind of just, when I first, when I moved to Austin two years ago, I, I just started gigging so much and I fell out of practicing and like deep diving a lot. And I, I'm trying to get more back into getting behind the kit and practicing and working on stuff. So I'm, I've just been getting back to that and I'm just trying to get more free. Like there was some shed, some like chop concepts that I was like, mm, I'm weak here and I've kind of been ignoring it. And let me not ignore it anymore. Cause like, I want to, you know, just like left hand lead stuff, just stuff I'm not great with that. I'm like, I don't really have an excuse to, I can just put some time into this and kind of not be lazy with it. So still, I'm always like, I feel like I'll forever be in the zone of like wanting to push myself and be better. Cause I'm just naturally kind of self deprecating in an artistic way that like pushes me. Um, totally. But I'll, to answer your question more, just a lot, getting better, obviously, at drums, making a sustainable living, but really a lot on the musical side. Like, I have my solo music, I have a new EP I tracked for, like, I'm trying to be more uh, outputty with art, if that makes sense. Totally. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a great approach. Um, apropos of which, where would you send people who want to look you up and learn more about you? Uh, just Instagram on Joel, Joel Turcotte or Spotify. My, my solo music's just under my name, Joel Turcotte on Spotify. And I have, I'm sitting on a decent amount of music. So I have a new EP. I'm hoping we'll be able to be out the end of the year or like early next year. And then I have a whole second album written that I need to, I'm going to track next year. 
Awesome. Are these with bands? Uh, this, my solo stuff, I write all the music. Um, I, I play it all and write it all on keyboard. And then I'll write the guitar and bass parts, and then I send those out to my homies to learn because I just can't play guitar or bass. Um, yeah, I write it all, and then I'll track drums for it. The pianos that I wrote for it will keep. And uh, But yeah, full band, all instrumental stuff, and then I'll get some guest solos on it. So you ever think about doing tours? That's the dream is to tour the solo stuff one day. There's just like so many logistical moving parts where I'm like, ah, oh, fuck, I have no idea. <laughs> like no clue about the actual music world in terms of like the business component and the functionality of touring in terms of like booking stuff. Like that's a whole other world I need to learn about or just eventually hire someone like a manager. But yes, I would love to, I've never gotten to play my solo stuff live yet. Um, so that that's the dream is to be able to, tour it hopefully that can happen cool man well thanks a lot for doing this yeah man thanks for having me always fun to talk bro